If you want to watch a really fast painter who's going to do something really unusual today, you need to watch. Our guest today is Linda Kemp. What are you going to do? Hi, everybody. I am planning to bend a few of the watercolor rules and hopefully inspire painters to try something new. And even if you don't know the watercolor rules, hopefully we're going to have some fun today. Well, hi, everybody. I just want to uh, introduce what negative painting is first before I launch into actually painting. So the typical way that we paint is positive. So you might draw your shape in and then fill it with color, texture, shading, gradation, and details. With negative painting, rather than filling in the object, we create it by painting the space around it. Now you can still do the shading and the um, tra transitions and details and so on, but instead of putting them inside the shapes, we're going to be putting them around the shapes. So that's a simple enough concept. Now the fun comes when we start to layer the shapes and that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be doing it wet into wet. So that's the, that's the big challenge. So here are a couple of little things to keep in mind when you start to do the layering. We always start, I'm gonna just pull up a little tip sheet here. You start with the shapes that are closest to you and then work back. You're always tucking the new shapes behind. So for example, here's my little, my little daisy sketch. So here would be the first step. And then I would let it dry and tuck the next layer underneath. So you can see here's another little daisy, but it's underneath. And then we put the paint around it. So it would look sort of like, like this. So those are the layering. That's how I build up my shapes. And let's just have a quick look at a couple more little things to keep in mind. You might want to take a screenshot of this or maybe just get your camera and take a, a picture of it just so these are little things to remember when you start doing this. So the new shapes are tucked underneath. We rely on the shapes and the edges to tell the story, not the inside details. If you want hard edges, you work on dry paper. And if you want soft edges, you work on damp or wet paper. Now, watercolor painters generally work with value changes going from light to dark. So you would begin, here's our little, here's my little value scale. So you would start with the lights and then watercolor naturally builds to the dark. We have other options as well, but today that's really what we're going to focus on is building by value. And I am going to work wet into wet. It's going to be all soft edge. So let me get started here. I will show you what my colors are because I need to get those up to begin with. And I've written them down at this side just so that you can refer to the colors. And it's going to look like I've got a lot of colors. And I'm putting them out fresh, as you can see. There we go. So I work with Holbein paints, which I love. And these are the fresh colors right out of the tube. I'm not working from reconstituted paint in a palette. Does that make a big difference? Oh, it's a huge difference, Eric. Um, you'll see when it comes to painting with the fresh paint, there's so much more impact with the color. I'm not diluting it down with a lot of water. It's a very fast way to paint. And it's just so much fun. It's just a blast to work this way. So let me just go over the list of the colors, even though it looks like I've got a lot of paints out here, which I think there's 11 of them. I, I'll just read through the list. So we've got leaf green, olive green, shadow green, cerulean blue, cobalt blue, royal blue, which is like a phthalo blue. And this is cobalt violet light, permanent violet, quinacridone red, Ross sienna and burnt sienna. Now that looks like a lot, but what I want to point out is that I have a light, a middle, and a dark green. A light, a middle, and a dark blue. A light violet, a dark violet, and so on. 
because I'm working wet into wet, I'm not diluting my color down. So if I want to have a light color, I'm not taking a dark and adding a lot of water to it. I'm just piling the paint on straight as it is. You're a good teacher. <laughs> I love teaching. I love teaching and I, I'm just absolutely crazy about painting. And, you know, I'm so excited about the possibility of putting paint down on, on paper or canvas or even on a wall. You know, that's where I'm happiest is when I've got a brush in my hand. So, so tell us what paper you're using here. Okay, this is a piece of Strathmore Gemini, 140 pound cold press. And it is about 11 and a half inches by 11 and a half inches. So I'm working with a square today. I, I love painting with a square, kind of suits my personality, but it also works really well with the format of the screen so that you can see as I mix my color and lay my colors down. That should be about in the right, in the right frame. Can you see all that paper, Eric? Yep. Okay, so I don't, breaking rule number, number two, first rule being I'm using the wet paint, fresh paint. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm not taping my paper down to a board. I don't do that. I just wet it front and back. I've got it thoroughly saturated here. There we go. And I'm using a big soft wash brush. That's a one and a half inch brush. So you, why, why, do you paint, why do you wet the back? That's what keeps it down on the, onto the board. There's absolutely no buckling that's going to happen. And what it's kind not, of board are you on? So this is a piece of um, a white plastic, but what I really like working on is um, one of the, um, I think it's a dry erase marker board. You can just get it at the hardware store. You know, when they do the, the um, conventions and they have this white board and they write on it with magic marker. Yeah. I like that because it has a, uh, a wooden backing so I can dry my painting on the back of it. So this will stay wet for a long time because there's water trapped under the paper. So for working wet into wet, this is just so much fun. And how much water do you want to have? So you want the paper to be thoroughly saturated, but not so wet that if I picked it up, water would stream off of it. I want the surface shiny. And I'm going to just leave that sit for a minute um, so that some of that moisture is absorbed into the paper. And I have, um, I think you have my, my reference photo there, which what I'm going to paint for you today is some wild asters. I'm not sure if you can bring that up or not. There we are. Okay, so this is what I'm going to use for my reference photo. And just to give me some ideas of the shapes and the colors that I'm after. You will never see me sitting with a photo in my hand and trying to replicate it exactly as I see it. I look for the shapes. I look for the color. Now it's up to me to be the designer as to where I put things. So when I start, I begin with an underpainting. And this is all wet into wet. So if you have the second picture there, you'll see it's kind of a blurry one. That's the sort of thing that I'm after in this initial stage. And then I bring it into focus as the paint starts to set up and I define the edges. So, so basically what you're saying is big shapes first. Correct. All right. And I wanna lay in the color in that out of focus sort of manner. Love it. Okay, so let's get started. Now, there's another thing that I don't do. I don't bother to sketch before I begin. I'm just gonna put some paint down on the paper. So here's a little bit of cobalt violet light, and then I'm gonna pick up just a touch of the uh, rose violet or quinacridone red and some cerulean blue. When I start, I'm going to begin with light or bright. 
and that's the way it's going to work. And then I'm going to get darker as it goes from there. So I'm thinking about where I want these little flowers to be. And I can see by the texture on the paper showing that this paper is starting to dry a little bit more than I'd like it to be. So I'm just going to dampen it down a bit more. Big brush. There we go. Okay. Let's get some more color on a little cerulean. I'm using a one and a half inch flat brush here and I'm just putting the color down. I'm not thinking here's a flower, here's a flower. I'm just putting this color down so that I have a base in which to begin my flower making. And I think that's kind of, that's pretty. There's a bit of cerulean. You will not see me making puddles with my watercolor. I don't work with a palette and add a lot of water and stir, stir, stir. I just get the color on. And I like this plastic board to work for my um, mixing surface. I have a paper towel in my hand. I want to make sure that that brush isn't too wet. And I think I'm going to just pick up a little round brush and drop in just a touch of some color that may or may not become the centers of these little flowers. So I just put a few bits here and here and here and here, just random dots, and then I might just put some there. There's my start. Okay. Now, let's start to pump up the value a little bit. So I use the cerulean blue, which is my light blue. And I use the cobalt violet light, which is my light violet. And so now I'm going to just go a touch darker. That is the cobalt blue. I think I'll stick with that cobalt violet light. I've written the names down here so that if I start saying this and this, you can just refer over here. So thinking about a flower shape, and I'm going to begin to cut some of these shapes into little flowers. Mm. There's the first shape started. Isn't that cool? It's it so is much, cool. It's so much fun. Now, when you dilute your paint a lot, which most of us tend to do with watercolors, what happens is as that paint dries, it starts to reduce in value. It becomes lighter. And that's because we've got all this water, a little bit of pigment and a lot of water, and you put it down and you spread it over, it, over the paper. And then as that paper dries, as the water evaporates, you're left with just a little bit of pigment spread out over a large area. When you work with fresh paint, like what I'm doing here, fresh paint, and you pile that on, even once it evaporates, you will maintain the value. So this will dry pretty close to the color and the value that I put down. So when we talk about value, that means how light or how dark a color is. And that's what we're after here. And I'm building this from light to dark. Okay, so there's two little flowers that have already started to be built. Hopefully you can see those. With negative painting, I want to build the next layer behind. So I'm going to just take a little bit of darker color. So now I've got a little bit of the, the royal blue and a little bit of the permanent violet, darker value. And my new shape gets tucked underneath. So here we go. There's two little flowers. There's another section underneath. Shapes and edges tell the story when you work with negative painting, not the inside details. Put another little flower right there. They just emerge out of nowhere. I know, aren't they? Isn't that neat? It's you're carving away at the shapes. 
Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four. I think that gives an idea of that. Let's get some color in now to establish where the leaves are going to be. I'll clean that off. That's me working cleaner than I usually do. I usually don't bother to <laughs> clean that off. Okay, this is called, uh, this is whole body leaf green. Isn't that sensational color? All right, so I'm gonna take some of that. I'm gonna take some of the raw sienna, my light green, my light raw sienna. So I'm back to the light values and I'm going to lay down the color that will become the leaves. You make this look so easy. Oh, good. You know, I think that's that's one of the things I hear so often. People who are um, have it in their in their head that watercolors are unforgiving, and that that's the hardest medium. And you know, I think the whole trick is to allow the paint to do the work for you and not to fight it. Enjoy what the paint will do. And that means experimenting. Not you a know, good thing for control freaks. Oh no, except when you experiment and practice um, with the paint, you start to understand what the paint is going to do for you and how to take advantage of it and to make it work rather than fighting with it. Okay, at this point, I've just kind of got this ball here of flowers. I've got the greens down, which are kind of nice um, as a start. And I'm going to, I'll break up that shape. I'll break up this mass in a bit. So one of the photos that I gave you, Eric, you'll see it was the third one that you showed and it's got some circles that say captured negatives. Yeah, we'll pull that up. Yeah, would you show that please? So a captured negative is the space between the leaves and the stems. So the outside negative space is that area around the flowers. And then the captured negative is that those little holes um, that are the dark, dark, dark spots. You can see them there on the little illustration. So I'm gonna pop in some of those right now. Okay. This is, the, this is my favorite part. My, my uh, Okay, you changed brushes. I did, I picked up a round brush. All right. Because I'm not carving. So I use my flat brush to carve shapes and I use my round brush to paint in. And I'm going to pick up my darkest colors. This is some burnt sienna. And I'm gonna get a gob of that. I'm gonna pick up a gob and then I'm gonna pick up a gob of the um, royal blue, which is like a phthalo. And I think I'm even gonna get some of this uh, lee olive, oh, shadow green. I have to look at my own list to see what I've got. Okay. No water, no stir, stir, stir. I've got gobs on there. And I'm thinking about those captured negative spaces. So the spaces between a stem and I'm painting in those darks. So there's, there's my first stem. The stem is light and it's got the dark on either side of it. Now, if I want this stem to be a quarter of an inch wide, you know, it looks pretty thick there now. I painted about half an inch because I know that paint is going to seep together and blur that. And I'm, so I'm just gonna put that in there. So I'm thinking about the spaces between the branches and I'll get some up into here. I will also, cut the bottom edge of that, that little flower. Get some more darks in. Gobs, gob, here's some more burnt sienna and the darks in there. No stir, 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 no extra water. I'm just putting this paint down so thick. You know, the first few times that you do this, it's gonna be terrifying. And you might just make a mud ball. It looks but, terrifying now. No, isn't it crazy? I love it. 
But now we're just going to put some more darks in here, just a few little spaces, just like so. One thing I think everybody needs to understand is don't get so invested in your work that you're not willing to experiment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like it's, it's just part of the, the game of it is learning to put that color down and trying, taking a few risks. I'm going to add a bit more burnt sienna into there because I want it to be nice and warm. Those bits. I mean, I'm just plopping that on there. Okay. Now let's go back up into this top section while that sits. I'm going to do more with that in a minute. I'm going to allow the paint to do all the work down here. But before then, I'm going to cut a few of the leaf shapes up in the top section. So those layers of leaves. And to do that, now I'm going into my mid values. This is the olive green. All of these colors are transparent that I'm using. All right. Okay. So no extra water. This needs to be thick in order to maintain control of the shapes that I'm making. The paint needs to be thick and fresh, gooey. If you try to make it with reconstituted paint from your palette, this will not work. It's just going to go all over the place. There's some leaves. So there's the first set of leaves. They're, they're sort of a yellowy green. And then I've surrounded it with the darker color. Let's go Linda, ahead. there's a question uh, from Ellen who says, how do you know that a paint is transparent? Oh, that's the best way to do it is to do some tests. And I actually have a, a test on my website that you can perform yourself in your studio or in your painting space. So you would draw a line on a piece of watercolor paper. I usually just use a um, uh, magic marker. And then you paint a stripe of color over top of it. And if the pencil line or the magic marker shows through the paint, then that tells you it's a transparent. If it disappears, if it's blocked out, then you know it's an opaque. Good to know. All right, let's get some of this down here. Edge and shape. I'm having fun with this, mucking around. Well, if you're not having fun, there's no reason to do it. Yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on it. All right, so we've got one. Here's a, here's a flower. One, two, three layers of flowers popping back in there. Then I've got my first layer of leaves, and now let's get another layer. And to do that, I need to go darker because we're working along the value scale going darker. And need to have the paint heavy, but not so heavy that I can't get it off of my brush, which is where I am about now. All right, there we go. Ooh, look at that, that's nice and dark. You'll also see that I paint beyond the edges of my paper because I'm using a big brush and I like to swing my brush rather than get a chokehold and try and stay within the lines. Dark. As far as figuring out the balance of this, how I want this design to move and flow and how I want it to swing and the kind of angles that I'm after, I can always work on that later. So here's the corner. This is the angle of this dark corner here. And here's the angle on this side. So that's nice. That's a little bit different. I don't want it to be exactly symmetrical. Here's a question. Barbara yes. asks, how do you know when a color will move fast for you? Oh, that's great. I'm going to show you that right now. I'm going to All do right. something. So you guys ask, you get answers. Yeah, exactly. Let's call professors and just say, Ugh. perfect timing. And grumble. All right. I'm going to pick this up. And um, first of all, I'm going to show you how wet this is. You can probably see how shiny it is as yep. I'm doing that and how thick it is. See, this is also wet. I'm really, really working with wet paper. And here we go. This is my very favorite thing to do. Very favorite of all it things. Is, 
It is. So now I'm going to start to spray this with some water and I'm going to spray it starting from the bottom and moving up until I hit that line right here right. where the color is. And then you're going to see which colors are fast moving and which colors are slow moving. Here we go. Does it depend on the thickness of the color? Well, the thickness makes a bit of difference, Eric, but a lot of it has to do with the pigments themselves. So the staining pigments, the dye type of pigments, any of the quinacridones and the phthalos are very fast moving colors. Anything that has a lot of sediment in it is very slow moving. That is a good time to stop because I got a chance to clean my arms of the paint that was all over them. You know, I'm a messy painter. <laughs> but here's what I want to show you. Do you see how this paint has separated out and the heavy, slow moving colors such as the burnt sienna are just sitting there. And then those um, phthalo colors, they're moving. And that's why I say it's painting itself. And I'm going to do a little bit more with that as well. But we're just going to get in a few little inside captured negatives to break up this space. And I'm going to, here's this lovely dark hole that I've got, but I want to just give a bit of definition and break up a bit more of the space in here. So I've got the dark up here and I've got dark down below, but I'd like to be able to connect those two to allow the eye to move from here to here with a stop or two in between. So I'm just going to pop in. Here's a question from Ginny yeah. Durst, uh, who says, how do you avoid muddy colors with so many colors mixed? Well, I'm not stir, stir, stirring because when you go in and you put your colors down, add a lot of water and then mix, mix, mix them, that's pushing those paints together and that's what's causing a lot of that muddiness. Now, the other thing is that we think about the term muddy is a thing that we fear as watercolor painters, but really, I'd encourage you to think about it instead of being muddy, I'd like you to think about it as being reduced intensity. And so when you have reduced intensity, what you need to do is just go grayer or darker. And I'm gonna give this a little bit of shot of water in there just to see if I can soften that up a bit because it's a little harder edge than I'd like it to be. There we go. Now, the other thing that's really neat gonna happen down here as this is sitting, I call this the velvet stage. It's lost the high shine. It's extremely vulnerable. And when I put little bits of water on it, we get the most sensational textures happening. Can you see that? And then I'm also going to encourage it a little bit more. This is a rigor brush and it's wet. And I'm going to just tickle a little bit of water lines through there to break that up because I love to let the paint do the work for me. And that's what's happening down in that section. So you're dipping the brush, you dip the brush into water and then you kind of made some stems. The water is on this long, long hair. And then I just put it on, you're actually forcing a back run to happen, but it's a back run where you want it to be. And if it doesn't move enough for you, you can just take a soft brush after a while and just tease over it, just a brush like this, and just tease the, at the, um, the line and it'll spread out a bit more. I'm gonna get another bit of darks into here. Linda, just, are you a, at all a plein air painter? I am, yeah, I love would you do? Would you follow the same principles when doing plein air? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. This is and how you paint. This you is do how break all the rules. You are such a mean and nasty rebel. It's true. Just ask my mother. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is that uh, 300 pound paper? Somebody's asking. No, it's 140 pound cold. 140. Press. That's yeah. it. That's my exact weight. That's funny. You would guess that. <laughs> There's another layer going in back here. So as long as this paper is 
damp and I'm able, then I'm able to put this paint down and build up these soft edge layers. When it starts to get too dry and I see the texture of the paper showing, then I have to stop and okay, that's it, can't do anymore. I can go back in afterwards and um, tighten up a few edges, but not, not when it's wet at this, like this stage now. Close. This is really fascinating. Are you guys digging this? If so, give a thumbs up or a like or something, a comment. I love that. That would be great if I know it. We have a world, a very broad worldwide audience today. I've seen people in there from Ireland, the Netherlands, England. It's just, it's just so amazing that we can get together like this, Eric. Thank you so much for hosting these events so that people can just come into my studio and uh, watch me do what I love to do. Yeah. You wouldn't want us all in there. Probably we wouldn't fit. <laughs> no, especially since I've, I've actually moved upstairs into my office for today. Oh, that's nice. Cause of the internet connection, I'm guessing. Yeah, correct. Correct. Tell us in the comments folks where you're watching from. Yeah. I'd love to hear. I'm just going to start to uh, fool around here with some of these shapes and see if I can make some changes that I like. Now, I have to tell you, when you work this way, there is no promise that it's going to turn out. You yeah. know, it could. You well, could, there's no promise with any painting. No, absolutely. And I think I'm going to try something here. This, right. is a, this is a don't do this moment. I'm going to pick this back up and I'm going to spray this area down and see if I can let that slide a little bit more. I'm going to start right here and take it down just to soften that up. There we go. And if I want the stems to move this way, I tip my paper so that it changes the direction of the flow. Oh, fun. So you can see now it's now the now the vase or the, the bouquet is moving this way. If you don't like that, you pull it up and straighten it up. I see somebody from my hometown of Austin, Texas. Hey, Austin, welcome. Norway, Finland, you guys rock. Thank you for tuning in. Great. Yeah. I'm so appreciative. Uh, we love uh, we love everybody. We've got people all over the United States. That's so nice. Can't read them all. Now, because I re-wet that, all that texture that I had has has melted together. That's all right. I can go back in afterwards. I think I'll just cut down into that shape a little bit. And I've taken as much. I take as much water out of my brush. You see how I'm still working with these gobs of color. And here we go. I think I'll just pull a few little shapes in here. So the tiny captured negative spaces that are trapped between the, the little leaves and the stems, that's what I'm popping in here now. Just a few of them, just to allow your eye to work from there to there to there, pop scotching through the piece. Donna Ebert says, I took courses from watercolor purists. They would scream watching this. <laughs> out loud. No, it's true. It's true, isn't it? Like, ah, oh, no. Well, I love it because you completely reversed the process. I, I think it's it was true. really exciting. Yeah. I, I actually, with all of the things that I do, it's quite um, very much the, the backwards way. I go about it in a different way. And, now, and you're going to be teaching, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're going to be teaching something entirely different on Watercolor Live. What are you going to be teaching? So what I'm teaching in Watercolor Live are the basics for doing this. How to, if you have never done any negative painting before, how to begin, how to see it, and how to build the layers on dry paper. And, and that's how I learned, and that's where I worked for many, many years before I uh, became more adventurous with my painting and started to work a little bit more uh, looser. 
So it's it's the basics that I'm going to be doing with watercolor awesome. live on beginner day. Awesome. Hello, Israel and Greece. Welcome. Shalom. I don't know what to say in Greek. Do you have any idea what to say in Greek? Not a clue. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> oh, that is so pretty. Now, when I when I paint the landscape, Eric, I start at the bottom and work to the top, which again is the reverse of what most painters do. Because with working with negative painting, as I mentioned, I start with the thing that's closest to me and then work to the distance. And so with landscape, that means I start with the foreground, build the middle ground, and finish in the background. The word is opa. Ah, good. Thank goodness to our crowd. That's great. How do I say it in Norway? Oh, I'm going calimera. to... Is the Greek say calamera? All right. See, we learn something new every day. Hello, Portugal. I think I'm going to just... I'm looking at this area. I resprayed it. It lost all the texture that was in there. I'm going to attempt to get it again. I'm going to do two different things here. Okay. One is I'm going to spritz, and my water sprayer puts out pellets of water not of fog it's just little droplets so i'm just going to sputter it over you can see hopefully that those textures are starting to come right here oh how lovely isn't that nice yeah i have <laughs> one of those bottles that puts out little pellets yeah that's what you want not not one that makes a puff of water now oh. in this area i'm i'm gonna see if i can do something rather dangerous i don't know we'll see whether it works or not all right. It's kind of nondescript. So I've got my round brush and it is wet. I have not dried it off. I haven't reduced the water. And I'm going to put a drop of water, drop of water, drop of water. So I'm forcing those back runs, that thing that watercolor painters are so afraid of happening. I'm actually going to put them on there on purpose. How oh, fun. Let's see what that does. You are truly a rebel. Oh. If I do it there, though, I better do it somewhere else, right? Get away with that. Yasas. Somebody says it's Yasas for, I don't know if that's for Greece. Yasas. Or Yasu. Just oh, that's really lovely. I'm going to tickle this through again, see if I can hold those lines. You know, with, with this um, tickling of water through with the rigor brush into this, uh, area. If you do it too soon, nothing happens. If you do it too late, nothing happens. So I always say, well, what's the worst that can happen? Nothing. No, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so, I just cut that edge just a little bit. All right. Now, for for watercolor painters that are worried about this color that I have out here, and think, well, that's wasting paint. What I do is when I'm finished my painting, I just scoop this stuff up and I put it into a palette like so. And I fill up, I'll, I'll clean that up afterwards. But that's how I do. So I'm not, I'm not. So there are times when you will have to reconstitute your paint. Yeah, absolutely. When this is thoroughly dry, if I decide I want to firm up some edges, I want to give it some crisper kind of definition, I'll do that on the dry paper, and I will um, use reconstituted paint to do that. Now, the next thing that I need to do, let me just get this off. In order for this to dry without buckling and so that it will dry in a reasonable amount of time, I'm gonna take a, uh, a, a my big brush, and I'm gonna go underneath it like a spatula, and I'm gonna pick it up, I'm going to move it onto a wooden board, just like that. And that's and going then, to absorb some of the water. Yeah, that will that will allow it to dry, and um, that that will help out. It's a nice soggy mess right now, but I'm satisfied with that. I so, like soggy messes. That's a good soggy yes. mess. And and when you uh, when you're painting, are, do you have your paint at all at an angle, or is, are you? This is flat. 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 The okay. Yeah, the most I angle is just 
you know, the, the back of my desk might be an inch higher than the front of my desk, but pretty much flat. All right. Well, that's so, another rule you've broken. I know. We're going to have to contact the watercolor police. Oh, jeepers. I'm not, I'm not going to open the door when I finish this, this uh, <laughs> today. I mean, uh, that, unfortunately, the watercolor police do not have a division in Canada. You're oh, very oh, lucky. Well, well, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put this back here, even though it's wet. I'm going to put it back just so you can see it without the muck around the edges so that you have a better idea of what the finished piece looks like. How would you frame that? Uh, I float mount it. Thought so. Yeah, so that that whole edge shows. Do you have anything float mounted handy that you could grab? Um, yeah, I do. Let me just pull that up for you. See, I'm always making people work too hard. I know, pulling things off my... So this one is actually in, uh, it's under glass, but you can see how you see all the deco edges. Yeah. So it's, it's mounted on a, uh, a piece of um, the same color map board as I use on the top and then, and that's it. So I hope that shows you what you're. A lot of watercolorists are now not putting things under glass. Yeah, I understand that, that they're, um, they're using, uh, um, they're varnishing and so on. I'm, yeah. I'm working with acrylics now. I don't know if you've seen that. Here's one of my, I've just got this fellow right here. So here's, here's one mm. of my little acrylics. The same idea, layering front to back um, with my acrylics rather than starting with the light. I can start mid value and then go darker and then come back to the light. Oh, so beautiful. Same concept, same concept. Okay. So that gives you an idea of how I paint. So you don't look like a rebel. You look like a very normal, law-abiding citizen. And you're just breaking all the watercolor rules. Well, I love to paint, and I love to share painting ideas with people. So thank you so much for you are You're very welcome. And you are such a good teacher. Everybody give her applause, okay. thumbs up, smiley faces. Thanks, uh, everybody, for joining you, us. You're a terrific inspiration. We will see you on Watercolor Live. Super. See you then. Thank you. Thank you.